thing. Um, but the experiences we had when we were supporting um, the delivery of 98% um, really did have a positive impact on patient care. Um, because I went to many departments where the, it was really difficult, um, that there were hugely long waits, staff were really stressed by it, patients were really unhappy by it. So I, it did make a difference. So I think the, the problem, I, if, it's, if I have any problem with targets, is when people deliver the target, you sort of hit the target and miss the point. Yeah, that was David Nicholson's phrase, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, so I think for yeah. me, this is, I think an ambition, a standard, a t whatever terminology you want to use, is the right is fine if it's based on improving care for patients, improving outcomes, improving experience for both staff and patients, and people deliver it mm -hmm. in a way that is meaningful. And where I don't, where I have, would have more of a problem is if it's a case of um, delivering a target in a way that actually ticks, as I say, it ticks the box or it hits the tar hits the target and misses the point. Mm -hmm. That's when we have problems. And what we did, um, what we did back in in the days when we were delivering ninety eight percent was we had. I used to go around and, and look and talk to people a lot. And where we found people that maybe weren't doing it in the right way, um, we had a very open relationship with staff. We would ring you up. People would just ring me up and say, Jane, can you come and have a look? And I'd go and have a look and say, I don't think that's right. Um, but it's, so it's about it's doing it for the right reasons. But it's back to my a, point that about that values. much pr less pressured days, wasn't it, where people were allowed to admit the fact they weren't doing something right. These days, a roof comes. Yeah, so what are we now, about 88% through, is it, Amy? Uh, are we, or have we just completely stopped counting? No, 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 we don't have a complete stop counting. It, no. it does vary across the country. We've still got places that are delivering 95, yeah. we've got some that are over 90. I and think some Fabulous Frimley Park is still... Fabulous Frimley is still, I don't know what, it, big, what the figures are, but they're... Uh, oh, they'll be 110%. <laughs> yeah. We've got a few that are, that are over 90 yeah. and delivering it and delivering 95 but I think there is is it all down to flow I mean if you look at the data um, you know the the big increase in attendances in A&E are the 25 to 55 yeah it's the the older people going through A&E is no surprise the problem we've got is getting them home of course that's true um, I think it's a com it is I mean Pauline Phillips is here she would tell you that there, it's a combination of Factors. So there, some of it is about flow through the department, some of it is about people using emergency care or emergency departments as a GP service or a primary care service and that does happen. Um, some of it is about flow from the emergency department into the beds um, and some of it is about getting is about discharging patients yeah. when they're ready and to go. And not all the discharge delays are down to social services, are they? No, they are it's, NHS it's, delays as well. It's half and half yeah. in some places. But we've reduced the number of delayed transfers of care. That has those those have reduced. Um, but we have got a lot more to do around um, supporting patients while they're in hospital mm -hmm. to go when they can. And we've got a lot more to do, as you referred to earlier on, around having appropriate uh, services in the community, whether that be social care or NHS, that are available seven days a week. And it's not a five-day service. Yeah. It needs to. We and, need to. And ESIS have that. done some fantastic work. Yeah, ESIS do some really good work. They're, they've been really courses. clever. We've watched yeah. what they've done and promoted a lot of what they've done on the academy. And I think they've done some great stuff. I mean, this so year we've had a big, much bigger problem with flu as well. So yeah. um, I think the flu, the increases in flu... Is that right we bought the wrong jab? It's all Steve, it's Simon Stevens' fault. Isn't it? <laughs> he, wouldn't, he wouldn't buy the right jab. I don't think that's true. I don't, I don't think that. I don't know. Yeah. I would have to go, but I can't remember. I, I have looked at it, but I can't remember now. Um, but we did, um, it, I think the... Depending on your age group and the type and your and the different individual patients, they react better to sick. To it's different a, it's types the older life. group, isn't it, for yeah. which there is a it's, different. So uh, if Kenny Gibson's still on the line, he can tell us yeah. the answer. Yeah, no, for God's sake, don't ask Kenny. He'll take the whole <laughs> program over. It's be the Kenny Gibson show. <laughs> but we have had. I mean, we did have a huge number of, of patients admitted this time um, with flu. Yeah. Than, um, so, so in London, we had some, at one point, I think we had something like 350 people. Mm -hmm. I, and and care homes. I mean, that, that piece I wrote the other day, I was, was inspired partly to read it, that the in, uh, the admissions from care homes was up by 63%. Mm -hmm. I mean, for God's sake, you'd expect care homes to be the safest place on God's earth, and there should be no admissions from a care home. You can put your granny in there, it should be cosseted and cared for and looked after and never get a sniff of a car bullock in a hospital. 
But what happens? 63% off. What's happening in care homes? What are you doing about <coughs> care homes? For God's sake, Jane. What do you expect? No, so, you know, I'll just add it to my list. No, yeah. seriously. What, so one of the things we done in, we did in London um, was we implemented um, uh, something through NHS 111, which was star five to star six, which actually means that if you're a paramedic or you're a care home, you can um, ring 111 star. Mm, I think that's clever. And you can, get, you can speak directly to a clinician. So you can speak to a GP, you can speak to somebody about that. And that has had quite a big impact. Mm. So care homes can now get direct... Shouldn't they just employ advice? more nurses? Well, all clearly I would say yes. Yeah. Um, but whether that's nurses in community and care homes, but the, I think I, the I, point I just think there should be a twenty-four-seven presence of, of a prescribing nurse in every care home. There's a difference between whether they should have access to one, but if you look, at, but the difference between a care home where people are not supposed to need nursing care, and a nursing home where they do need mm. nursing care and they do have 24 hours. Yeah, well, nursing that's different. Care. But I mean, I think that the acuity, you know, people go into a care home, they're okay, they need a bit of help to jog along, <coughs> but their acuity drops off a cliff, and before you know it, they're, they're in the cusp of nursing care. Absolutely. And the yeah, care homes, yeah. fair enough, they're not funded and they're not prepared mm. and they're not equipped to provide the nursing care. So that's one of the priorities that we're looking at. We will be looking at. This I just year think you again. should change the registration and say you can't be registered unless you've got nursing presence. That is a CQC discussion and decision, which I know you would love to have. I think that... Um, Don't mind talk to me. <laughs> I, think it, I think you really seriously have to. I mean, it's, it's easy to say what you've just said, but really difficult to do. Yeah, well, it's like um, four hours in A&E. It was it easy is. to say, but we did it. Know, uh, and it's not enough to say, with the greatest respect, Chief Nurse, it's not enough for you to sit there and say, well, that's a job for the CQC. No, it's a job for the health service. No, you said about registration. That's a job for the CQC. Yeah, well, we, However... But they, we should tell them what we want bloody registered. What I do think we need is we need care homes and nursing homes, whatever, whatever you call them, that are... Safe homes. Yeah, clearly. Um, I completely agree with that. But something that is able to respond to the needs of the people whose home it is. Yeah. And some of those people need nursing care, some of them don't. The trick, I think, is to have services that are flexible enough to respond when a patient um, or a person <coughs> in a patient, um, actually becomes unwell or ill. And if it's a care home with no nursing support and somebody becomes unwell, they need to have that nursing support brought in to support them. Yeah, and ring, I think that's ring the nine difference. nine nine. Somebody wrote to me the other day, works in a care home, they dialed 999 six times in one day, six ambulances for six different people, carted off the hospital with the flu. Really? Well, they need to talk to us in London then, because we've got a fantastic approach that we did. There's a really good example, care home in Camden. We'll get on to London in a minute. No, I'll just tell you about this, because it's, really, it's a really good story oh, in good. terms of what you've just talked about. So we had a care home in, in London where they had people, uh, individuals with symptoms of flu. We put in a system this year that we learnt from learning from last year where we had similar examples to the one you just described, where the individuals had a rapid response from a GP who went to assess. Um, they were kept at home. We instigated antiviral medication, which was, was delivered to the care home within a matter of hours. We put additional, there was additional nursing support that went in, um, and all of the patients that had flu or flu-like symptoms remained in that care home. Not one of them mm. went to hospital a year before they'd have all gone. Mm. Because that's what and that that's system that's now the way being, to do it. being rolled out across yeah. the country. And the NUFs have just the NUFU have just done a report with the with some of the London CCGs and very much the same thing. And we have the uh, when we keep on about it, we've got the academy's got full of examples yeah. of, of how the care home can can be improved. But when you look at the data, you know, the the incidence of admissions from care homes, it just says sort this out, doesn't it? Anyway, so there you are, you pitched up in uh, head office with a nice soft job as the chief nurse. Yeah. And when was that? 2012. 2012. March 2012. So in the last six years we've run out of nurses, they've been uh, <laughs> not been given a pay rise, we haven't got enough of them, the whole thing is that we can't do safe staffing, uh, but apart from that, how's it gone? <laughs> A lot worse if I had <laughs> That's the best answer, isn't it? I'd rather give us a round of applause. <laughs>
said, okay, so we pick, we'll pick our way, <laughs> so we pick our way through the problems, yeah. So okay, um, we'll start with a bursary because you, you were you had uh, you had a bursary. I imagine most people here had a bursary of some sort. Um, <laughs> it, it, and it's curious, isn't it? Because it hasn't it hasn't made the difference that the that people say. I mean, it has, I mean, it has put some people off, but we've still got more people applying to be nurses than we've got places to train them. In, yeah, across the country, that's true. Yeah. So we, uh, so the numbers it has reduced. So I think everybody anticipated, expected, and said that we will see a reduction in the first year. Mm -hmm. um, the experience of um, changes, to student loan changes to the general degree um, population was that it dropped off for the first year and then picked up again. This year. Um, so the UCAS applications for September of this year have dropped again, um, which is worrying. Um, I think the difference is because we know that people applying to be nurses and midwives, um, generally speaking, are sometimes slightly older. So the average age of a graduate a couple of years ago was about 27, 28, 29. Um, and that affects the finances. So well, it just means that they are... That it, so if you talk to 18-year-olds, most 18-year-olds come out of, out of school and expect expect to have a loan to go to university um, it's I think for many of them it's quite a surprise that they when they were previously applying to become a student nurse and realized they had a bursary they just didn't uh, they didn't necessarily expect that <coughs> if you happen to be a bit older and you've already had one job or you may even have had one you've already got a degree um, or you've got your life is such that you may have a home or a flat mortgage or you know it's it's slightly more difficult and more and more complex for people to be able to do that so but having said that despite the drop um, in people applying, we are still we still do on an aggregate level have slightly more people applying to become a nurse than we've got than the, the places are there. There um, clearly will be some risks with that that in terms of the type of nurse or branch of nursing. So we've had a bigger drop off in mental health learning disability than we have in some of the others, and there will be some differences in job offers. Having said that, I think what I when I was um, I used to get emails and letters and comments and people from, from nurses that student nurses that had bursaries who said that the bursary wasn't enough for them to be able to live on. So they had the bursary but they couldn't they still couldn't afford to live and travel and go to clinical placements. So they would really struggle with that financially. So although and I'm not trying to make this sound better than than it is, but it, they, the access to the loan does mean that people can get more money now than they could before. Um, having said that, we will we still need to work. I think we, we need to monitor it really carefully. In theory, um, it should create more places. It should it? create more places. Could the what, uh, is the, that is that happening, John? Uh, yes, there was. There is a. I mean, we've we've got a. We funded through. Um, we funded a, the twenty five percent increase in the number of clinical placements that people can have. So we've got the ability to take more students. HEI, so it was the university, it was the Council of Deans and the universities that actually said, if we have if we have a student loan system, we will be able to train more nurses. Mm -hmm. um, which was partly one of the reasons why that that went ahead. Mm -hmm. So I think now it's a case of them re us having a really good campaign and, and something that actually really properly properly tells people what the role of a nurse or a midwife or a AHP actually is because there's a huge amount of myth and negativity out there and actually when you talk to a lot of people yes it's really hard people are working so diff it's in, it can be so difficult at the moment in terms of workload and pressures and lots of temporary staffing to fill some of the gaps that we've got um, but loads of people I speak to still love the job and still think it's a fabulous career and so we need to shift the uh, my personal view is we need to try and shift the balance a bit so we we tell it as it is. Um, we acknowledge the difficulties and the pressures and the and the hard, really hard work it is. But we also talk about the, the, the benefits and the impact. You're right. I mean, I must say, as an outsider, if you look at the responses you get from NHS England about the problems, or generally, they're much more fanged. If you look at the rubbish that comes out of the Department of Health press office, I mean, I don't know how anybody can work at the Department of Health press office and look at themselves in the mirror. I mean, they talk such rubbish. But you do talk, I think, a surprising amount of sense on what the, what the problems are. So I think you've got that right, Jane. I won't ask you to comment on that. But so I, I like the surprising. It's a surprising thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. 
but it, it's unfortunate, Jane, but quite a few comments from newly qualified nurses mm. and midwives going, yeah, that's great, we, we work with the, with the student loan now, but actually my salary has now gone down and predicted will go down with the pay rise, predict, with the proposed pay rise because of the increase in my student loan. So they're saying that it's been worked out for them that actually their student loan payments will go so up. So it's tipped them into a high level of repayment because of their... So is what, that, so I'm not saying, sure that... Is that so this right? is for just qualified okay. nurses. I wouldn't, I wouldn't argue with that, because I'm, but I did, I, have, I did look at the numbers on this because I published a, a very comprehensive spreadsheet that Joan uh, Le Pan... What, how do you pronounce his surname? Joan? Oh, Joan Ponsmouth. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Joan. Joan, sorry, Joan, yeah. if you're listening. Uh, and he, <coughs> he did a, a very complicated spreadsheet mm -hmm. where he, he absolutely dissected the, the pay rise, and it's pretty clear that it isn't why it isn't beneficial wholly across the board. It's not like a pay rise. It's, it, it is selective. But there again, it was designed to be selective because the, the sort of band fives... Uh, uh, and six, it was targeted at them, wasn't it? Um, it's re it is a really, it is really complicated yeah. to, um, to... It's not just a, like a pay rise that everybody gets an uplift. It has been targeted. And I think it's fair to say there probably are winners and losers. And I know from uh, that the starting salary of a nurse, a band five nurse, I think go goes up by 2021, <coughs> just over 25,000. Yeah, well, then, <laughs> that's right. If it's 25,000, it will put them into... And, that, and of course, that, the student loan repayment yeah, that will has put gone them up into to 25,000. Yeah, that will put them into repayment territory almost immediately, whereas previously, I think it was about 22,000, 23,000. Mm -hmm. So they didn't repay immediately. But their salaries are lower, so they would... Yes, say, that's, yeah. that's, that's yeah. right. So I think, I think it is fair mm -hmm. to say that there are winners and losers. Mm -hmm. But it's so complicated that, that I don't think anybody can decide who the winners and losers are. I don't know. If you're a loser, I guess you'll know. You'll work it out for yourself. I guess so. And it's, I think it, you know... Well, I mean, what are we to make of the pay rise? Because the, uh, it seems to me that um, the RCN... Well, the, R, the RCN are going to put it to a ballot, are they? So it, it will go out to consultation. All of the unions... They have um, to consult. Yeah. ...will be consulting. Yeah. yeah. And that, so the cons consultation will run... It will be up to individual members of those unions to decide what, what they think about the pay rise. Um, my understanding is that all the unions are recommending acceptance of it, including the RCN. Um, isn't the GMB? The GMB is the only one that isn't, um, yeah. as far as I can remember. But the but it will be down to individuals, and uh, <coughs> I think it's a it's a decision that everybody, every member of staff, everybody that is on an agenda for change, will need to look at it, what it means, and look at. Uh, what decision they want to take. They have people have worked really hard with the unions and, and staff side and department and NHS employers to come up with the proposals. And we know um, from what the government have said publicly is that they've put four point two billion pounds in, yeah. into it over three years. Well, that's what that. I mean, which that's, is it's still at so least infuriating when they say, "Oh, we put a yeah. shedload of money in," but yeah, but it's not as easy as no, that. I mean, we've had a we've got a, a, a group of the you know. I would go as far as to say probably the backbone of the NHS with, with, with junior doctors and nurses. Mm. I mean, and nurses particularly, they've gone seven years without having an uplift, uh, a, a, a pay rise, an inflated pay rise. And, you know, and then now we've got a, a result that's so complicated <coughs> no one can work it out and it's a fudge. But I think on the other hand, you have to accept the fact that, I mean, it's, it, these are government choices and we don't want to go into the politics of it. But I think people have got so far behind that it's beyond the life of one parliament to catch up mm. with, with... I mean, you can't neglect to give pay rises for seven years and hope to catch it up in one year. The economy won't stand it. No, and it, it has been incredibly difficult for, m for many years and pretty much for the whole time I've been yeah. at CNO. I mean, there was a complete um, pay freeze for two years. Um, there has been a 1% pay rise for mm. um, several years, and of course within that there have been incremental rises for people that are on agenda, agenda change. change yeah. But if you happen to have been on the top of an increment, um, then actually you're at risk of looking a lot less. Um, yeah. for Do you while. think that agenda for change, I mean I was around when agenda for change came in, I did a lot of those evaluation exercises, mainly with midwives. Mm. Um, <laughs> um, do you, I mean when it came in it seemed to be very sensible. 
uh, and it created a career structure for nurses. Do you think Agenda for Change is sort of um, seen its best days? Are we looking for Agenda for Change 2 now, do you think? Well, I think the, rec the changes that have been put forward in um, the pay deal that is going out to consultation does include some changes to the way the Agenda for Change plans yes. work. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something that we need through to through the pathways. Yeah, isn't you it? progression go, through you the pathways. You go faster, to, from the, but you can get up, you can go through it faster. But I do think that's something that people need to look at quite carefully. We need to review yeah. what happens in the future. But certainly, there there has been. This is why I think the the current pay deal, the pay deal has been so complicated for people to get their heads around because it's not just about the uplift. It's also about um, the number of increments and the progression and what that means. Mm. And actually differential increases for people at different levels so obviously yeah. the lower banding staff are getting a higher increment higher increase initially so that i think <coughs> it, is, it is incredibly complicated and it does and for every individual they need to look and review it yeah. I think. Oh, well they'll make their own decision yeah. and we'll see what the result of the ballots are yeah. right